Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks to the, I just want to thank quickly the organizers of this event, um, all the panelists, uh, the previous panel and this panel. Um, I think it's very timely, uh, obviously, uh, considering the seriousness of the situation right now in Rakhine State and regionally in Southeast Asia uh, and Bangladesh as well. Um, I was previously working with Human Rights Watch, and I can say a little bit about some of the research that I did with them as well. Uh, now I'm working with Fortify Rights. Um, we're providing, we have a two-pronged mandate, so we're providing technical support to human rights defenders, and uh, we're also conducting independent human rights monitoring. Um, and it's the latter that, that I'll, I'll share uh, with you today. Um, I want to say a few words about the current situation in Rakhine State, current meaning in the last couple months and re even right up to, uh, to the last couple weeks, um, because, um, well, of course, there are some really concerning developments happening there. Uh, and I'll also talk a little bit about uh, this new report that we've released February 25th about abusive restrictions uh, against the Rohingya population in Rakhine State. Um, as some of you may be aware uh, and may know quite well, uh, there were attacks against uh, INGO and UN operations in Sitwe, uh, the capital of Rakhine State, approximately one month ago. Um, those attacks began in earnest March 26th and 27th. Um, this was further to months of threats and intimidation against aid workers in Rakhine State. And I think it's worth noting that those threats and that intimidation was never properly dealt with by the central government. And in some cases, um, people who are associated with the state government have participated in those threats and, and in that intimidation. Um, 170 aid workers were uh, evacuated. Um, there was a complete shutdown of humanitarian efforts uh, in the state. This, of course, came just four weeks after MSF, or Doctors Without Borders, was evicted from Rakhine State. Um, this essentially made a crisis even worse. Um, and the cumulative destructive impact of the humanitarian deprivations have still not been properly documented for a number of reasons I'm happy to talk a little bit about. Um, some aid workers have returned to Rakhine State. Um, you know, there are at least, uh, the conservative estimate is 140,000 displaced. The number of people who've actually been forced from their homes is far, far greater. Um, enormous numbers going to Bangladesh. Um, thousands upon thousands, we don't actually have an, an, a, a precise figure, are taking to the sea and leaving the country. So when we see this figure of 140,000 displaced, um, uh, it could be misleading uh, if, if meant to indicate the number of people who have lost their homes. Um, we've been to many of these camps, these IDP camps in Rakhine State. I've personally been there several times um, conducting this research. The most urgent needs now uh, are medical care, food, water and sanitation. Shelter is an issue for some of the population as well. Um, again, it's been nearly two months since medical aid was denied uh, to the displaced population and to non-displaced Rohingya as well. Um, and as a result, as can be expected, uh, preventable deaths are occurring on a regular basis. Um, uh, uh, the condition, this is, this is a direct result of the conditions of life that have been, been created by the state and central government authorities. There's no question there. Um, the government's latest claim uh, is that Rohingya families with sick children are refusing medical treatment so that they can show foreign visitors their sick children. Um, this is the level of thinking among uh, the leadership in Rakhine State. Uh, and we've seen similar statements like this for the, over the last couple years, um, painting um, uh, uh, the Rohingya in this light. Uh, in some areas, local farmers are assisting IDPs, sharing rice and other food, and there have been some rather heroic ethnic Rakhine who um, have also uh, supported the displaced population. Um, of course, they do this at great personal risk, um, but there are human rights defenders in the Rakhine community as well. Um, of all of the IDPs, I think it's worth mentioning specifically the thousands of unregistered IDPs, and the dynamic of the, the internal, the, the population of the internal displaced people is similar to what was just described in Bangladesh. Um, the unregistered IDPs are the IDPs that the government does not recognize as IDPs, um, and some agencies uh, have followed suit. Now, when they're not recognized by the government as IDPs, they're not recognized by the aid agencies as IDPs, and if you're not recognized as such, you don't receive the same benefits. 
Um, so they're therefore treated differently and there aren't, they aren't eligible for aid that registered IDPs are eligible for. So when the aid operations, if the aid operations improve um, uh, soon, this is still going to be a problem. There are still going to be thousands upon thousands of Rohingya who are not going to be receiving humanitarian aid. Um, and I think it'll be important to, um, to, to, uh, to continue advocacy on that front. Um, these people are being referred to as economic IDPs. Um, so in, in other words, a whole new category of, of internally displaced person was just invented out of thin air. Um, this erroneous idea is basically that these people, the claim is that these people were not displaced due to threats, violence, or persecution, but that they've simply come to the camps in search of aid. Um, again, this is a deeply misunderstood uh, uh, idea. Um, going back to 2012, um, uh, I was in Rakhine just after the violence started in June, uh, returned again when it reignited in October 2012. In both instances, uh, at the time I was working with Human Rights Watch, uh, at both instances uh, we documented killings of Rohingya by state security forces, uh, widespread community organizing by local associations, monks associations, and others. And in some cases, uh, government officials were involved in meetings and organizing what was essentially forced population transfer, which is a crime against humanity, as explained in, in previous reports. Um, our report, we released this report uh, February 25th. Um, we had hoped for a more respectable response from the government of Myanmar. Um, we had sent uh, a letter to various ministries. We sent a letter to the president's office explaining the research we were conducting, explaining some of our findings, and we listed about 15 different questions for the government. We received no response to that, uh, and this factored into our decision to, to publish the report. Um, within an hour of the publication, the president's office uh, made statements referring to Fortify Rights as a quote-unquote Bengali lobby group. Uh, and they refused to answer any questions about the findings. Um, as mentioned uh, uh, by the uh, moderator here, the, the report is based largely on 12 uh, leaked internal government documents. Uh, these documents comprise three regional orders and five addenda to the regional orders. They date from 1993 to 2008. Um, the documents basically outline the architecture of abuse that's been in place in Rakhine State for many, many decades. Um, the orders and policies infringe upon or restrict the rights to non-discrimination, nationality, movement, marriage, family, health, and privacy. Um, and I should mention, too, that um, this report is by no means exhaustive. These are abuses that have been documented in great detail for many, many years. Um, but in terms of the actual policies and orders that we obtained, uh, there's no reason to think we obtained all of the policies and orders that exist. Um, uh, we've, also, uh, we've also obtained four other internal documents from 2013. They relate specifically to Muslims outside Rakhine State. Um, like many of Myanmar's laws, the restrictions uh, that we obtained predate the current government, uh, but I think it's important to note that they're all still enforced, and of course the situation is deteriorating considerably. Um, there are some fantasies among certain members of the diplomatic community who want desperately to believe that Myanmar's central government uh, is not involved in the persecution of the Muslim, uh, of the Rohingya population. Um, essentially, there are some uh, members of the diplomatic community who want to believe that Naypyidaw's hands are clean. Um, I think uh, there's, there's uh, not enough time to get into the dynamics of all of that, but um, sadly, there's no shortage of evidence. We've documented central government authorities speaking on record about enforcing and tightening these restrictions against the Rohingya, uh, both to the media and on record in parliament. And then, of course, there are the actual state policies, uh, which it should be noted have not been, uh, the policies and practices have not been abolished by um, the, the, the government of President Thein Sein. Um, and he would have the ability and authority to do that. Um, I think perhaps the most sinister thing about the abuses against the Rohingya uh, now and over the course of many years is the very transparency of it all. Um, if you go to Rakhine State, people sp speak very freely about, um, uh, about what their intentions are in this case. Um, also the fact that the abuses are not solely the product of a rogue state-level government, which Naypyidaw has been trying to push this narrative as well. Um, uh, 
three problematic areas of restrictions that we documented are against childbirth, marriage, and movement. Um, I won't get into all the details uh, of these, but um, we did obtain and publish a Rakhine state level order that basically criminalizes Rohingya childbirth outside of wedlock and applies restrictions on the right to determine the size and spacing of one's family. Um, in practice, this has been known as the two-child policy. Um, this has, of course, led uh, families to flee the country. Um, on the issue of marriage restrictions, there were official orders from 1993 to 2009. Of these, uh, these are regarded as population control measures, and this is listed very clearly in documents that we obtained back from the 90s right up until 2008 and 2009. So there's been a consistent, um, consistent framework for those abuses. Um, our central finding in this particular report, with regard to these specific findings, is that um, uh, the government officials are responsible for the crime against humanity of persecution. Um, you can read some of the, the, that in the legal section. Um, uh, to conclude, there are a lot of categories of abuse, uh, a lot of categories of abuse um, that have been documented um, and, and that are continuing to occur in Rakhine State. If we consider only the restrictions that are imposed on the Rohingya and only the avoidable deprivations of humanitarian aid, it's very clear that the authorities are inflicting certain conditions of life upon the Rohingya that are calculated to bring about physical destruction. Um, at this point, there's very, little, um, there's very little debate in my mind about this question. Uh, the situation is, again, deteriorating continually. Um, I think my time is up, so I'm going to leave it at that. But I just, again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Zarni and Tunkin and all the organizers for this event. Thank you very much.